Not quite two weeks ago, my husband Kevin defended his dissertation to achieve the title of doctor, a culmination of his doctor of theology program. His defense was logical and concise, and within a half hour's time, his committee was done, approving him for the title of doctor. <laughs> This two-sentence synopsis of this event, along with a yummy dinner that evening to celebrate, was basically what happened that day. End of story, close chapter. But of course, this short summary doesn't even begin to convey the gravity of this experience for Kevin, for me in a supporting cast role, and for the emotions we both felt before, during, and after that day. This just the facts ma'am version of that day misses so much. The six months that Kevin spent pondering and writing his entire book about liturgical semiotics, the meaning he infused into the pages, the worry that it wasn't enough, that he had missed obscure book X or random article Y that he needed to include, that he didn't have enough time while also serving two churches and tending to his family in the midst of a global pandemic. And the day itself, once we approached the day of his defense, I will readily name that I was anxious for him. I wasn't worried about the end result. I knew his work was brilliant and that Kevin would present well. But nevertheless, I found myself unsettled that day, unable to focus on much of anything until after his afternoon appointment. But then afterwards, oh my gosh, the joy. I, think I immediately called my mom and my brother to share the news. Kevin did the obligatory Facebook update. Carol had me opening the door, connecting our offices and saying, he did it, he did it. <laughs> so that two sentence version, that brief story I started my sermon with, does not begin to describe and convey all of these emotions all of the fears, all of the blood, sweat, and tears that went into the fuller reality of what transpired. So too, I think it is with what we are given in Luke chapter 24 that Art so eloquently read just a few moments ago. These are just 12 verses. It's essentially a paragraph in length. Their brevity barely conveys the magnitude of the experience. Several women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joanna, along with others, approach the tomb, arms heavy laden with spices for the purpose of honoring Jesus's body, as was custom. But they found the stone rolled away, and they did not see the body. Suddenly, two men appear and tell the women that Jesus is alive. The women immediately tell the news to the disciples, who largely do not believe them. Had we been a fly on the wall for that conversation, we might have noted that women's stories being disbelieved is an occurrence not limited to just one time period. <laughs> Our text, by the way, translated, translates it as idle tale. That's a very poor translation. The Greek uh, word that is used in that passage is more like garbage. <laughs> They actually really do not believe this woman. It's not an idle, gossipy tale. It's nonsense. They do not believe it. So Peter goes to the tomb to look for himself. He is amazed, but then returns home, not talking to anybody, so the text, if they do, the text does not say so, returns home by himself to think this all over. So what has been boiled down to us low these centuries hence is a shortened version of the story, right? with so much detail and nuance eroded away over time and translations and centuries. But we do get a hint at one thing that has made it to us today. It's the emotions that preceded and accompanied Jesus's resurrection. The first emotion conveyed is one of confusion. Where is the body? Quickly followed by fear. And not just fear, pure terror. Fear amplified to the nth degree. Now we've been talking about fear at Woodmont UCC throughout our Lenten season. This was our theme for the past six weeks. And it leads us to today. This is the pinnacle of that. 
It is a fear that literally causes them to fall to the ground. Fear of the unknown, fear of not understanding, fear of this new reality that is facing them, fear of powers beyond their understanding, powers of God and powers of the universe. I mean, dead was dead, right? To say it is not is frankly terrifying. I wonder if that fear actually dissipated when the being spoke to them saying, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. I'm not sure that would have calmed my fears in that moment. <laughs> to be told by celestial beings that my friend's body was gone because he was actually alive? They had witnessed the death. There was no hemming and hawing about this. That was known. This sounds like nonsense. But that question, why do you look for the living among the dead? It's a shocking question, followed by an even more shocking statement. He has risen. What a momentous experience to be in the midst of. But they don't have long to process this before the story turns again. The two men go on to say, remember how he told you when he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again? The text says, then they, the women, remember <coughs> his words. They remembered his words. In our fear conversations these past several weeks, we've consistently hearkened back to one truth, that even in the midst of our fears, our very real fears, our very understandable fears, God holds us. For Lent, a number of us have been reading a book called How Not to Be Afraid, a memoir written by Irish author Gareth Higgins, Higgins grew up in Belfast during the midst of the Troubles. Higgins writes that from his experience, his wisdom, his journey, he has learned that fear is a gift. Now hang with me for a moment on that. He writes this, this book is about learning how to feel fear without being driven by it. It's about knowing the difference between healthy fear and paranoia. It's about becoming tender enough with ourselves and connecting enough with our true selves to find the gift underneath the fear. Now, I will admit that fear as a gift was a tough pill for me to swallow when I first read that. I have tended to folks with deep anxiety and trauma over my years of ministry. I'm not inclined to see fear as a gift. But the gift of reading a book like this in a community of people is that when I brought my confusion and slight abhorrence of this idea to the group, we talked about it and turned it over in an ever-deepening conversation. <clears throat> and several folks present had the insight of being able to name that fear in the moment <clears throat> might not feel great, but reflection upon that fear causes us to go deeper, to see what Higgins describes as being underneath our actual fear. What are we most afraid of, really? Throughout Lent, we spoke about the fear of being and having enough, as seen in Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. We saw the fear of things not working out for Abram, when as an older man, he heard again God's promise of descendants. We saw the fear of failure at the fig tree and the anger that can come when failure feels imminent. We saw the fear of shame when the prodigal son and the older son are invited to return to the father. We saw the fear of embarrassment when the woman douses Jesus with perfume, a fear she shrugs off very quickly, but which is still in the air. And last week we saw the fear in Palm Sunday that can be present even in the midst of celebration. Jesus knew he was going to his death. Each week, we also saw God never leaving someone in a place of fear. Do not be afraid, God seems to say over and over again. Fear is real, but it is something 
that does not have the final word. And this week, we see God say, I have a new story to tell you, housed, paradoxically, in an empty tomb. Take those fears, those pieces of yourselves you're most ashamed of or worried about, put them in the tomb, roll the stone in front, then see what I can do with them and with you. Fear as the gift that leads us to the tomb and causes us to peek in with that hope that maybe the dead is not there. And this is what we see in the Easter story. The women at first are petrified by their fear, but then they go deeper. They remember his words. They are galvanized by understanding. It stirs something within them such that they cannot help but return to the disciples and share this news. Between those two things, the terror and their spreading of the good news is that little half verse, they remembered his words. One little phrase, but it communicates so much. There's a holy pause there, a connectional moment between the feeling and the moment of their fear and then their action. They remember Jesus and his promises. They remembered his words. In their memory, they recall feelings. In memory, they recall to mind the whole picture, the entire scene, both scary and miraculous at the same time. Two things sometimes being better than one. In reflecting on a memory, they say, oh, that's what Jesus meant. They remembered his words. In the Disney film, The Lion King, we see lion cub Simba deny who he was meant to be for his seminal early adult years. If any of that rings a bell for those of us who have gone through early adult years, I commend this movie to you. It is not just for younger ones. A wise and elder in the form of a ridiculous baboon named Rafiki brings Simba to a holy place and shows him to look for the living. We do not look for the dead among the living, but we look for the living among the living. And in Hollywood fashion, James Earl Jones's beautiful godly voice bellows out, remember who you are. Simba remembers his father's words. He returns to lay claim to his kingdom. And it's a beautiful story. But the part that I love the most about this movie is one screenshot. It's towards the end of the film. Simba is ascending Pride Rock to be inaugurated as king, and it's raining. From others' perspectives, they see this kingly lion confidently putting one foot in front of the other as he goes up the mountain. But there's one moment where there's a close-up of Simba, and he looks worried. He knows what's at stake here. He saw his father die because of it, and his footsteps shown up close are tentative. They're almost faltering. But, and here is the miracle, folks, he keeps climbing. And his footsteps continue. He looks up the sky parts, he hears remember once again, and the ceremony proceeds. I love the trajectory of that. His fear those cautious steps, and then a response of yes to his call. And they remembered his words. Simba remembered his father's words. The women, the women remembered Jesus' words, his teachings, his whole being, and they run off to tell the others. They embrace the calling placed in front of them to share this news and know they are not believed. Even by Peter, who's an interesting case, Peter is amazed, but he doesn't really do anything with that feeling. He goes home. And that's quite the juxtaposition. The women who are terrified, but who then share the news. And Peter, who just sort of meanders around home, dazed and confused. I have compassion for Peter, though, because it can take time for the truth to settle in. Right? But the charge here, I believe, is to keep climbing to not become stuck in our fears, to not sit at home and merely be amazed for too long, 
If the women had not shared this news, if Peter had not been moved beyond the amazement phase, where would the church be today? The gift here is sharing stories in community. I can picture the disciples turning this over and over in their conversations. This is nonsense, right? I'm slightly terrified by this. I don't want to believe it, but could it really be true? And then by remembering the words of Christ and sharing feelings and thoughts in community, realizing the joy that it is true, and figuring out together then what to do next with that. So beloved of God, a short story with very few words, but with them a great deal of emotions, moving from grief to confusion to fear, and that is not the end of the story. God is not content to leave us there, to leave us in grief, searching for dead things. May we remember the words of Jesus, words of life emerging from death, words of comfort and love and welcome emerging from places of fear and terror. May we all feel the feelings. They are real. Denying them only stops the climb. But just as God remembers us and refuses to leave us, instead breaking into our world with good news, with life, with more life, and then life again, may we, with our fears, remember the promises of God and not hesitate to ascend, sharing the truth of God's life-giving love as we journey together. The church depends upon us to live as people who have put parts of ourselves in that tomb, only then to have God say, hey, I can resurrect that too. Yes, even those bits of you that you feel are dead, remember who I am. I am the God of life. Thanks be to God. In the name of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.